get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Link Senior webinar. Today, we are providing one free NAB, NCAP, NCCDP, and NZSRDT CEU credit. In order to be eligible for the CEU credits today, you need to remain on this webinar for the full hour. At the end of the webinar, I will provide the required post-webinar CEU survey evaluation link in the webinar room chat box, and we'll also send it by email this afternoon. Please be sure to check your email spam folder. This survey must be completed by midnight Eastern time this Thursday. If you have any questions about our CEU process, I am pasting our FAQ document into the chat box right now for you to take a look at. Please know that our CEU certificates will be issued by email before the end of the day on Monday, March 22nd. Again, please check your spam folder that day. And now I will hand it over to Charles DeVille Morn, Link Senior CEO and co founder. Charles? Thank you so much, Megan. And uh, as always, welcome, everyone. Welcome. It is today, March 16th, 2021. And this is another of our Activity Strong webinar for resident engagement professional. And today, um, wonderful education session by the fantastic Nancy Ewald, who's the Chief Content Officer of Activity Connection. And believe it or not, it starts as an activity director walks into a bar, right? So before we get into today's session, I want to do a quick word of introduction by sharing a little bit about myself and the uh, CEO and co-founder of Linked Senior. Um, Link Senior is the company behind the Old People Are Cool campaign, and uh, in, in a, as a response to COVID-19 last year, behind the Activity Strong campaign to acknowledge the fantastic work that all of you activity and life enrichment professionals have been doing and continue to do every single day, provide you with tools to further uh, your work, and obviously, uh, fantastic uh, education, which obviously includes today's presentation. The company itself is a company that I co-founded. Again, we're based in Washington, D.C., and we provide a evidence-based resident engagement platform for senior living. So we serve independent living, assisted living, memory care, and nursing homes in now 44 states and Canada. We are actually a platform that is evidence-based, so a lot of what we do is about engagement but it also is about tying engagement to, uh, you know, obviously quality of life, but also clinical and financial outcomes for your organization. So if you're interested in learning more about us, please um, feel free to reach out through the survey or our website or email. So today's webinar actually started, um, you know, this series of webinars started before Activity Strong about three years ago. Uh, because of a obviously a huge need that we understood in the market, which was the need for better education. And we're very committed at that um, um, from the perspective of Link Senior because we believe that the more activity directors are equipped with quality education, obviously the better they could do their job, which serves our ultimate purpose, which is to then obviously increase, improve the well-being of the elders, the residents we serve. And believe it or not, Nancy was one of our very first speakers uh, almost three years ago. So with that, let me share with you just one quick thought in terms of introduction, which is, you know, the and you've probably heard me say if you've been on webinars before, our, our deepest belief beyond Link Senior, anyone that is in the resident engagement field, is that finding purpose every day is simply a basic human right. So. With that, I, I, I do want to take a second and, and pause and thank everyone on the line for the amazing work that you've done in the past year, right? A lot of us are marking the one-year anniversary. Um, you know, there's this hashtag called Remember the Moment when things have unfolded for us. And so from the bottom of my heart, from, you know, from my team, and I'm sure from Nancy and the rest of the Activity Connection team, thank you for the fantastic work that you've been doing. 
Um, with that, let me tell you a little bit more about Nancy. So Nancy is the co-founder of ActivityConnection.com, which is the industry-leading resource for activity professionals. Her novel ideas and creative approaches for, to programming have made her a sought-after consultant as an expert in the field. After attaining a MS degree in allied health education, Nancy's early activities involved teaching microbial biology and working with pipettes and, I don't know how you say this in English, benzene in French, so I'll say it in benzene, burners. However, while taking some time off to raise three children and care for two ailing seniors, Nancy discovered her true passion and decided to make a midlife career change. She returned to the workforce as an assistant activity director for a full-service community. And it wasn't long before the success of her innovative programming caught the attention of industry leaders. That was 30, days, 30 years ago. Nancy went on to author six manuals for three national companies. She eventually accepted a position as a national director overseeing training and program development for 170 communities with all settings and level of care. When Nancy left the corporate world, a few years later, she was determined to help solve the challenges of the professional profession she had seen firsthand. She devoted herself to expanding and developing Activity Connection, which now serves activity professional in all U.S. states and all Canadian provinces and territories, benefiting over a million and a half seniors every month. Fantastic accomplishment, Nancy. Oh, but thank you, Charles. <laughs> That's what's written here. I'm going to share with you how I met uh, Nancy. When I saw a link senior 12 years ago, 13 years ago, um, an activity director pointed me to Activity Connection. And I called Nancy and I asked her for some advice. And, you know, when you are a, an entrepreneur, um, you call on to people and often you just get no's. You know, people are not interested in new things and, and that kind of thing. And sometimes you get a yes, which is what makes things exciting. And Nancy said yes. And Nancy started helping us. And believe it or not, Nancy, it is actually uh, 12 years on April 20th, that I flew and met with you and your husband, Bob, oh, as wow. you were giving us, <laughs> yeah, as you were giving us the first advice on how to build Link Senior. So for anyone that is a uh, Link Senior client, you know, I think now is the time to thank also Nancy and Activity Connection for this uh, very long and standing and fantastic uh, relationship. And um, for anyone on the line that surprisingly would not be aware of Activity Connection, I highly encourage you to look into the resource. It is what I believe the most helpful and um, most productive and most complete solution for activity directors. So with that, Nancy, I'll let you uh, take it from here and um, let you start sharing the screen. Okay. Well, let me try this here. Okay. Yeah. Uh... Okay, can you see my screen now? Yeah, absolutely. Well, great. Well, first of all, I'd like to ditto what Charles said about what amazing job everyone is doing. And, and it's you do an amazing job every day, not just during the uh, COVID crisis. So I wanna acknowledge that. As activity directors, you wear many hats but the gestures hat might not be a good fit for you, or you, or you might feel that it's not appropriate for your profession or it's not appropriate for your business. So my goal is to change your thinking uh, so that you think of humor as a very serious subject and one that is, is appropriate and uh, that you really need to appreciate uh, and it's essential to the quality of life. So let's begin by defining what we're talking about. Most people think that humor and laughter are the same thing. They're closely re related, but they're not synonymous. They're, there's a cause and effect relationship between them, uh, but they are defined differently. Humor is actually a complex mental and cognitive process. In fact, when they do an MRI, humor um, actually uh, affects the frontal lobe, it affects the sensory lobe, it affects, affects the physical areas of, of the brain. So almost all the brain is involved. 
And playfulness is considered the basis for humor. It's like your brain is playing around with thoughts and it often involves being surprised or what they call violating the, uh, the expected. So your, your mind will say, oh, gee, that's not what I expected. And humor can result in laughter, but you can experience humor without laughter. And so humor is really an umbrella term that can be defined as anything that amuses, makes you smile or laugh, or it list, elicits feelings of happiness, cheerfulness, playfulness, or joy. And this is just not my definition for this uh, particular webinar. This is what the, the experts who study humor and humor therapy, this is how they define it. And one other thing I'd like to say is that humor can be, it does not have to be verbal. For example, music or art or um, listening to um, a funny um, uh, piece of music, all of that can be classified as humor. Laughter, on the other hand, is more of a physical phenomena. It is a spontaneous, nonverbal vocal expression, and it exercises your muscles, your diaphragm, your chest, your abdomen, and even your face. So you can laugh without a humor stimulus, just like you can have humor without laughter. You can have laughter without humor, uh, without, uh, you can have, you can laugh without anything being humorous. For example, tickling is a perfect example of that. And also laughter is contagious. A few facts, laughter is largely a social behavior. We laugh 30 times as much when we're with other people than we do when we're, when we're alone. And you were born with the ability to laugh. And adults laugh 17 times compared to about 300 times a day for a child. And couples who laugh together can laugh together. So are we the only animals with a funny bone? All the great apes respond to being tickled and make a, a, a very um, laugh-like, human laugh-like sound. And they're not the only animals that are in on the joke. For example, um, giggles have been picked up by ultrasound when rats are tickled. And other animals also, for example, penguins are ticklish on their stomach. Uh, even elephants are ticklish in their armpits. And um, tickling and the, and the concept of tickling would make a really good discussion. Uh, so did we say that the, that is catching? It's hard to listen to somebody who's laughing and not laugh yourself. And so we're gonna try a little experiment here. I'm gonna show a, a clip of a small, of a, a short clip of a video, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> It's actually a clip of some um, gray parrots who were um, quarantined in London and they taught each other to swear. And the staff thought it was so funny that they, decide, uh, that they started laughing and then the parrots started mimicking the laughter. And so when I play the clip, see if you can keep yourself from laughing. I've shown this clip actually, <clears throat> excuse me, to my four-year-old granddaughter and also to my neighbor. He's 74 years old. He never smiles. But when I showed him this clip, he couldn't help but laugh. So let me see if it'll come on. So how did you do? Were you able to stop yourself from laughing? So how did humor evolve? Humor evolved over, uh, over millions of years and laughter actually preceded speech. And the theory is that speech actually developed out of laughter. And since nothing really evolves in nature unless there's a reason, so what was the reason for laughter? Well, the evolution of laughter was more about survive, survival than it was about enjoyment. Laughter sounds were a way to signal danger, to signal all is good. And it was also as, as groups grew larger since there's safety in numbers, 
laughter promoted social bonding and established roles within the group. Laughter may have also helped early ancestors express mating intentions. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's theorized that females found the men, uh, the males, more attractive uh, when they laughed. From ancient Greece until uh, the 20th century, humor had a bad reputation. It uh, was often considered scornful and mocking. Plato thought humor was malicious and evil and should be taught tightly controlled. He said, such represent representations shall be left to slaves or hired aliens and that they receive no serious consideration whatsoever. No free person, whether woman or man, should be found taking lessons of them. And then Aristotle also thought most people enjoyed amusement a little bit too much, and he discouraged it. Democritus, known as the laughing philo philosopher, was an exception at the time. He was instrumental in development of the atomic theory. Um, and then also the word humorous was not used in its current sense until about the 18th century. Humor was a Latin word for fluid or liquids in the body. And it was thought that there were four main fluids in the body. And the combination of those fluids determined your personality or your disposition. Humor had very little influence on our culture until about 100 years ago, at least in the United States. England was really a little bit ahead of us on this. Before that, laughing and even smiling too much was considered foolish or unintelligent. It wasn't socially accepted. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson um, was traveling over in England and he wrote back saying, oh gosh, get me back home because he wanted to be around people who, va uh, who valued merriment less and virtues and power more. And we often wonder why people didn't smile in early pictures. One theory is that, that the camera wasn't developed and people had to stand very, very still in order to get their picture taken. But it's also much more likely that it was just not socially acceptable for people to laugh. And even Mark Twain thought it would be bad and foolish to, that you would look foolish if you were caught smiling in a photograph. Attitudes began to change in the late 1800s, however, and that's when we found that university students were beginning to publish their own uh, humor publications. Yale was the first one to publish uh, a student humor magazine. Then, Har then was the how uh, was the Harvard uh, Lampoon, and then later on it was the San Stanford uh, magazine that came out in about 1899. So even though people weren't smiling, even in the Victorian and Edwardian eras, by the by the 1920s and 30s they began to show their pearly whites and smile in photographs. So we can kind of thank the college students for humor development in the United States. So what's funny and what's not? Laughter is a universal language. However, our sense of humor is subject to different, to individual differences. Since humor depends on many things, it depends on geography, where you live, it depends on your culture, your race, your age, your gender, your education, language, and even the content of the humor. And there are four styles of humor that are acknowledged by those who study humor. Affiliate, affiliative humor is sharing humor about things that everybody might find funny. It's a very positive and inclusive type of humor. Self-enhancing humor is finding amusement in life's challenges and staying positive. For example, uh, maybe slipping on a banana peel and then um, finding something funny in that. Self-defeating humor is putting yourself down in an aggressive or poor me fashion. And I know you're all familiar with Phyllis Diller and uh, Roger uh, Dangerfield. I don't get no respect or I was so ugly when I was born. And then there's aggressive humor, which is put down or insults targeted towards others. And you can think Don Rickles, Joan Rivers, uh, maybe George Carlin. So does your sense of humor change with your age? <clears throat> a study at the University of Akron um, took some adults of various ages and some of them were shown in the office and others were shown Golden Girls and other uh, sitcoms. 
And they found that the young and the middle-aged adults considered aggressive humor, humor to be funny, while older adults didn't. Older adults preferred the affiliative and self-enhancing humor. And it, um, they could not definitely tell from the study with that, the, that the sense of humor had changed. In fact, <clears throat> they thought it was much more likely that the humor in our sitcoms have changed over the years and not our sense of humor. So what's your humor style? There is a 32 question humor style questionnaire that you can take online. It's very easy. And then at the end, it will give you your, your scores. And it is a test that's been translated into over 25 different languages. And it's used in a tool in over 150 research studies. So take the test and find out what style of humor you prefer. Humor comes in many flavors, any of which may appeal to one person or culture, but not to another. <clears throat> For example, slapstick, you can think of Laurel, Laurel and Harding. That's a very visual type of, of uh, humor. Deadpan is where you tell a joke, but you keep your facial expressions. I love Bob Newpart, Newhart or uh, Jack Benny was good at that, or Buster Keaton would be another example. Exaggeration is think of things like um, the Roadrunner cartoons. It's more of a juvenile type of humor. Topical humor is news and current events, making uh, fun, fun of <clears throat> current events. And you can think Jon Stewart, um, Saturday Night Live, a lot of the late night shows use topical humor. Uh, satire, you can think of things like Funny Guy or the Simpson, Simpson Show. Um, Surreal or absurd humor is kind of bizarre. It's kind of nonsense topics humor. Uh, I think of Corn, Conan O'Brien or Marty Python. And then there's situational humor, which are your sitcoms. There's improv. And of course, the, the king of that would be Robin Williams or Jonathan Winters, who were really good at making up things on the, on the fly. Wordplay is witticism. It's more intellectual type of humor. And um, Shakespeare used that kind of humor. Mark Twain, Oscar Wilde, Woody Allen, and even Groucho Marx used that kind of humor. And then the juvenile uh, humor would be things like pranks. Uh, there, are other, there are many other types, for example, spoof or parody. The Onion would be a good example of that. And then there's the shock humor of Howard Stern, uh, Bill Maher, George Carlin. And um, British humor tends to be a lot more satire. Uh, one person put it this way, in England, um, the person is the joke. In the United States, the person tells the joke. So that's a little background and history of humor, but what are the health benefits of humor? Humor is good for you. It's good emotionally, physically, mentally, cognitively, and socially. Humor is emotionally healthy, and we don't really need a scientist to tell us that. It elevates our mood, it interrupts negative emotions like worry, anxiety, depression. It releases the feel-good chemicals, the happy hormones, the serotonins in our brain. It makes us feel happy. It adds cheer cheerfulness and joy. It inspires positive outlook. We feel better about ourselves. It increases a general, general self sense of, of well being. And it just makes us feel good. Excuse me, let me take a drink here. And I love the, the music from uh, Despicable Me, the happy song. Uh, first of all, the lyrics are very, very inspiring. Uh, clap along if you feel like that's what you want to be. Clap along if you know what happiness is to you. But there is a, um, um, a verse near the, near the end of the song where it set, basically says, bad news, don't waste your time. I'm gonna be fine uh, because happiness is what I want. And a lot of communities have actually made their own videos uh, dancing to the happy song. And I'd like to show you one of my favorites. And excuse this if there's an ad at the beginning of this video, because I'm not sure if, it, if uh, it will show up or not. 
Well, I guess it's there. about these videos is you'll find that everybody in the community gets involved from the administrator to the housekeepers um, to the dietary staff and it, it's really a, a fun community effort humor is also physically good for you it exercises your lungs increases intake of oxygen rich air which is beneficial to people that have um, bronchitis or emphysema it stimulates the heart and improves the circulation and the blood flow. What it does is it raises your, and we're talking about laughter mostly, it raises your heart rate up and then, and your blood pressure up, and then it cools down and you get a very relaxed feeling. So it soothes and reduces your physical tension in your muscles. <clears throat> it decreases the stress and agitation hormones. It increases uh, your serotonin, which we talked about. It also boosts your immune system by increasing what they call the national, natural killer cells like your lymphocytes. And it improves pain to tolerance, again, because it relaxes the muscles, but also it's a distraction and increases your feelings of energy. So it's not like it, you can replace going to the gym, but 10 to 15 minutes of laughter burns about 40 calories. That's one Lorna Dune shortbread cookie. And that could be enough to lose three to four pounds over the course of a year. <clears throat> and your blood pressure can drop as much as five to seven points following extended laughter. Agitation levels can drop as much as 20% with regular humor therapy. <clears throat> your muscles stay relaxed for about 45 minutes after you laugh. And laughter exercises your tummy muscles. Uh, so if you want those six pack abs, you should start uh, laughing. And so you might say, okay, right, yeah, the, all that's true. So where's, where's the proof of this? Well, there are scientists out there who do study humor and the effects of it on the human body. Uh, the study is called gelotology. I love that word. And so here are just a few of the results that you can find out on the, um, in some of the research um, uh, websites. The first one up on the left was uh, a group, um, that they studied for eight weeks in a nursing home. And uh, for eight weeks, they were given humor, th humor therapy. And you can see the pain level, level dropped. And at the same time, the happiness level went up. There was a controlled study in, in the, this group also. And then on the right, you can see the first, it might be difficult to see, <clears throat> but um, you can see a decrease, slight decrease in blood pressure, a slight decrease in heart rate, a pretty significant increase in serotonin level, which is your, your happy hormones. And also uh, as that increased, also they saw some change in the, in the natural killer cells. And then on the right-hand side, the dark bars that you see there, that's uh, a saliva test. And if you're, as your stress level goes down, the number of stress hormones in your saliva also decreases. So they found that that uh, people who participated in these humor therapies, that the stress home hormones in their saliva had decreased. 
Um, also, when you uh, let me, okay, I want to read the the uh, the joke. O'Reilly was on trial for armed robbery. The jury came out and announced not guilty. Wonderful, said Riley. Does that mean I can keep the money? So what happens when you hear a joke is your whole brain is kind of in on the joke. The surprise ending is an element of, of humor. Not knowing what, what's going to happen makes your mind kind of think. And the punchline makes you kind of realign your thinking. So jokes work because they defy expectations. The brain says, hey, you know, that's clever. That's different. I wasn't expecting that. And then you laugh. And so we think differently when we laugh, when we, um, when we laugh or when we hear, when we hear humor, we think differently. I and mean, that also makes us think more creatively. How does it affect our long-term memory? Well, the funny bone is connected to our sense of wonder and humor activates our sense of wonder, our curiosity. And that's how learning begins. So humor motivates us to learn and also helps us retain what we've learned. A study at Sam Houston University found that students were more likely to recall statistics in a statistics lecture if they also included some jokes about statistics. So uh, you're more likely to remember and share information if it made you laugh. But then the question to me is, why can't I remember jokes? So I'm gonna let that to you to explore. What about uh, humor and our short-term memory? Laughter in particular increases oxygen and that improves brain function, including our memory. Laughter decreases our stress hormone, cortisol, and less stress means it's easier for new memories to be stored and accessed. Uh, a one study of healthy adults, um, half of the adults were shown a funny video for 20 minutes, the other half sat quietly, and after they performed, afterwards they performed a memory test and they found that um, those who watched the funny video scored better on short-term memory tests and saliva tests of stress hormones as compared to the group who did not watch the video. And you can actually read about, read about that study on the ABC News program. And what are the social benefits of humor? Remember that the fundamental evolutionary purpose of humor and laughter was to facilitate cooperation between members of a group. So it, Humor draws us closer to others. It promotes social bonding. It adds positivity and co to conversations. It helps diffuse conflicts. It promotes cooperation and builds trust. <clears throat> it strengthens relationships. It promotes playfulness. Uh, so actually spending time with friends might be as healthy cognitively for you as doing a crossword puzzle. And did you know a funny guy gets the girl? Studies have shown that women consider funny men more attractive. However, the men didn't particularly like women who responded in a witty way. That's, that's kind of interesting. Funny people who participate in speed dating were deemed more attractive. Also, 90% 90 90 of men and 81% of women college students report having a sense of humor as a critical characteristic look for in romantic partnerships. E Harmony agrees. In fact, they adjusted their, their um, uh, algorithms uh, so that their um, website could capture that those kinds of things. And a good marriage is, is, is no joke. Married couples who share a similar style of humor are tend to be happier and have longer relationships and feel more secure in those relationships. What about humor and dementia? Well, a change in the sense of humor could be one sign, early sign of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Loved ones and caregivers have reported noting changes as far back as nine years before more, more common symptoms presented themselves. Early on, the person laughed very loudly at things that were just mildly funny. And then later on, they would increasingly laugh at, at dark, dark things or at inter, inappropriate, inappropriate times. For example, if there was a, <clears throat> excuse me, um, 
uh, disaster shown on the television that might make them laugh. And patients liked slap, slapstick more than they had 15 years earlier while, while showing less appreciation for satire and other forms of humor. So um, a change in humor could be an indication of onset of dementia. But the, there's good news because dementia may change a person's sense of humor, but humor can also help their quality of life. And remember again, humor is an umbrella term. It's anything that amuses, makes you smile or laugh or elicits feelings of happiness, cheerfulness, playfulness, or joy. The first principle in using humor with people who have dementia, of course, is to make sure you really know them. But this was something that kind of surprised me as I was doing a little bit of research that studies suggest clowning helps seniors with dementia connect to their immediate surroundings, recognize family members, remember the past and improve cognitive functioning and communication skills. And we're not, the professionals, are, we're not just defining clowning as putting on white makeup and so forth. Professional clowning is defined as spontaneous improvisational play and it's a growing field. There are now elder clowns, medical clowns, familial clowns, clown doctors in Australia where you can train to become a laughter boss. And you might be familiar with Robin Williams in the movie uh, Patch Adams. Uh, there is actually a real Patch Adams. He's a physician, comedian, clown, activist, author, founder of uh, the Gesundheit Institute. And if you'd like to learn more about him, you can go to www.patchadams.org. And perhaps you'd like to sign up to be a, a Go Cloud, a leadership program that they have. But one of the main elements of clowning is improvisation. So you make it up in the moment. And one of the rules is to follow conversations of yes and, or yes, yes, let's. And what it does is it allows the conversation to continue so people are making more connect connections. Improv is also a growing therapeutic technique that's being used for uh, disease management for Parkinson's disease. So if you'd like to learn more about that, you might check that out. <clears throat> um, training and certification, if you'd really like to get certified as, uh, uh, in therapeutic humor, uh, the Association of Applied and Therapeutic Humor <clears throat> is probably uh, the, the Harvard of, of places that you can go. It's a nonprofit organization of researchers and practitioners. <clears throat> they emphasize the personal health benefits of laughter and also, also the benefits uh, that teachers, company CEOs, and other professionals can bring to the workplace. Uh, it's kind of a long process and it's kind of a stepping process. But when you're finished, you can become certified um, as a certified humor for professional. Uh, we actually have somebody on our team who is um, working their way through the Association of Applied and Therapeutic Humor. Uh, the World Laughter Tour uh, is another um, way you can become certified as a laughter laugh leader. Uh, activity directors can actually earn 11 hours of, in, of, of CE. You credits uh, through this program. And then there's Laughter Yoga International. Laughter Yoga has become uh, very, very popular. And the premise of it is fake it until you make it. Uh, it combines laughter exercises with um, uh, yoga breathing techniques. And you can become a certified laughter yoga leader through the Laughter Yoga University if you're interested in that. Um, as far as becoming, like going to college to become a humor therapist, um, therapists can specialize in, in uh, laughter therapy, but you have to be degreed or licensed as a psychologist or, or counselor or social worker first, but maybe someday there will be. So is being a comedian the road to longevity? Should we all become comedians if we want to live for a long time? Um, the list is long. Don Rickles, Mel Brooks, Jerry Lewis, Jerry Stiller, Carol Channing, <clears throat> Cloris Leachman, Bob Hope, George Burns, both lived to be 100, Bob Newhart, Sid Caesar, Milton Berle, Jonathan Winters, Dick Van Dyke's 95, Betty White just turned 99 in January, and all of these people lived to be at least 87 years old. 
I have to also include Rosine. She, she was my mother-in-law. She lived to be uh, 100 years old and she smoked until she was 97. And, but the one thing I remember about Rosine is she always started every day. She, she would pick up the newspaper and read the, the comic section first. She said, that's how you always start your day. Um, these, and you know, you could say, well, they're, look how long they live. So being funny must make you live longer. But actually they think that these people grew up in an era where there was less stress, uh, less pap paparazzi, the tabloids, you didn't have the social media. And also they had less access to drugs. So what came first, the chicken or, or it's kind of a chicken uh, or egg thing. Are people healthier because they laugh? or do they laugh because they're healthier and they feel better? So will laughter make you last? Maybe, maybe not, but at least you'll enjoy the ride. The sculpture here, pictured here, sits on my desk and it was given to me by a very dear friend many years ago. And it's an elderly woman on a magic carpet and she's her head thrown back and she's laughing. And the name of the sculpture is called Wild Ride. And every morning when I come into my office, it makes me smile. And it reminds me that no matter how challenging my day might become, that I am on an amazing journey and I should laugh. So if humor is good medicine, it's priceless, it's fun, it's free, it's easy to take, and there are no side effects. So Robert Provine, who's the noted laughter expert wrote, I envision a time when, psych and when physicians might recommend that everyone get 15 to 20 minutes of laughter in a day in the same way that you recommend at least 30 minutes of exercise. And perhaps they'll write a fit prescription of frequency, intensity, time, and the type of humor that you should have. So what are we afraid of? What is holding us back when it comes to humor and humor therapy? Do we think it's too silly, that it might not be appropriate, uh, that it's juvenile, childish, frivol frivolous, foolish, that it might undermine our image as a professional, that it maybe make us look indifferent to a, their condition. It might undercut the seriousness of the business. This is a serious business, so we should act seriously. It might offend, it's unsure, we're unsure of the reaction we might get, and we just don't feel like we're a funny person. But why should you show your humorous side? Shared humor should not replace care and concern. It should actually add to it. It creates a more humanistic environment. It makes us more relatable. It reveals the home version of ourselves. This is the real me. It makes others feel more comfortable and closer to us. It lightens the mood and allows connections to develop more quickly. <clears throat> it shows caring and respect. It, it says, I respect you enough to let you into my life. It gives permission for others to join in, which might lead to them also uh, presenting some humor. And a, a little tip, is to share something personal about yourself or your day. For example, I spent all morning helping my son search for his Easter candy that I ate last night. Or let me show you this cute, um, funny card my husband gave me for our anniversary. That's a good way to start these kinds of relationship is about yourself. An activity happens when we interact with our environment, either people in our environment or the things in our environment. So the right stuff in the environment can lighten up the community. For example, a designated humor bulletin board, a curiosity corner filled with kind of novelty type items, uh, cheerful artwork and photos, fun coffee, shop, coffee table books, like a joke journal or a cartoon catalog or funny photo album. Um, a jar or a basket filled with jokes and smiles, a throw pillow with uplifting say sayings on it, 
uh, humor section of the library. Uh, smile stations, for example, setting up um, cute pictures on all of the hall tables and lightened lighthearted posters in elevators such as mood elevators. You are also can become the humor. Every encounter with a resident is an opportunity to um, lift spirits. So you are the best activity. You should become a walking activity and get everyone on the staff doing the same thing. You can carry or wear, wear things <clears throat> that are humorous, for example, uh, carry a curious item or even a, a cute picture or a, a funny quote in your pocket. Uh, put together a funny folder or smile folder that you carry. Uh, wear a lapel pin or button or, with a clever or a clever tag or a funny sticker. I love the one that's here. It says, can February, March? No, but April, May. Um, you can wear something uh, humorous and you don't have to go wild. It can be just something that's, that's cute or a little bit different. Uh, you can carry funny props. I used to carry... Um, it was a, a miniature um, magic eight ball. And so I would say things like, you know, do you think my husband will cook dinner for me tonight? And, you know, and then show it and it would say, uh, probably not. And it would always evoke a smile. Uh, of course, now you can make sure that the masks that you're wearing um, have smiles on them. Or you can alter your physical appearance. Like for example, you can sport, sport a new hairdo or paint your nails a rainbow color, perhaps. And let me share my own personal story about this. It was <clears throat> many years ago, but it was Spock Day. And I happened to have a pair of Spock ears uh, left over from a Halloween party. And they were very flesh-like. And so I just said, well, I'm going to wear those to work. And I put them on, but I wore my hair in kind of a um, uh, um, bouffant, and it came down about shoulder length over the ear. So I just let the tips of the ears stick out. And so all day I went around and I thought, you know, people, this is really, they're really gonna find this cute, but nobody said a word to me. Uh, in fact, people will kind of scurry away from me. I sat down on the couch next to one woman and, and, I, and I said, you know, how are you? And she said, oh, I'm fine. She said, how are you? And I said, well, I might, I've got an earache. And she, she looked at me and she said, oh my. And she scurried off. And so that evening at dinner time, I went into the dining room and I pulled the ears off and everybody went oh, like this. And I said, you know, did you really think they were real? And the response was, well, we thought that's why you wore the hair, your hair the way that you did. But that, that day was one of the funniest days I think I ever had as an activity professional and very memorable. Don't forget to smile. Smiles put you in a better mood. They make you look more pleasant and trustworthy. Makes you more attractive, maybe even look younger. Makes you more memorable. Causes a ripple effect, because when you smile, the whole world smiles with you. And tr tricks your mind into laughing. Marilyn Monroe said, a smile is the best makeup any girl can wear. Did you know babies are born with the ability to smile? Children smile about 400 times a day. Adults smile about 20 times a day, and it's a universal greeting. And excuse me, I'll take a drink of water here. And there's a very interesting article, if you get a chance to read it, it's about how more diverse cultures smile more, and that Americans smile more than other countries, especially some European countries. And they said that's because smiling is a universal greeting. And so, so the more diverse a culture is, the more immigrants, the more they smile. And there is one piece in the article where they ask, um, um, they, they put a um, question out on the internet, which is what's the big giveaway that somebody is American? And somebody from Finland wrote in and said, when I see a stranger with a great big smile on their face, I assume they are either drunk, they're insane, or he's an American. So I guess it's a real giveaway that we smile a lot, but I'm glad we do. Um, here's an experiment you can try. Some studies have shown that people look younger if they smile. So try guessing the ages of a person from their picture. You can take um, two pictures um, 
people the same age, one smiling, one not smiling, and see if a group can guess which one they think is younger. And then also don't forget to exercise your smile lines, make, um, uh, make that a part of your regular exercise program. And you can make all of your programs or fold a little bit of, of humor into every program that you have. A little levity can go a long way. Uh, for example, you can read the funnies first if you have during your news group or start exercise class by telling a joke uh, to exercise everybody's funny bone. You can be begin uh, other programs by sharing a cute photo or a cute quote. Uh, you can break up the monotony of bingo by saying B4, I call the next number, or O, oh, here comes the number, or I wish I were 29 again. Uh, heads up on this. Uh, take it from, from experience. I wouldn't try this with a serious bingo group. Uh, they don't appreciate it at first. You can pause during discussions for a merry moment. You can share a pun while you're waiting for the craft glue to dry. It'll have everybody in stitches. And humor can be in any category. Whatever your programs that you have already scheduled, most of them can be a humor program. For example, exercise, fit, and funny, balloon games, dancing can be very humorous, especially my husband dancing. Crafts, cheerful crafts, making smiles on a stick and those kinds of things. Art class, uh, learn how to draw a cartoon or a funny picture. Book club, uh, for your book club, uh, um, feature Emma Bombeck or Mark Twain, funny authors. For your news group, uh, read headlines and, and humor or headlines bloopers. Games, giggle games. Um, charades, matching joke with the finish line, um, comedy shows, uh, funny films, uh, bingo. You can make your own bingo cards with other four uh, five letter words. Um, music, uh, there's a music, amusing music, funny songs and song titles. Uh, you can make funny crafts, food crafts. Snack time could be juice and jollies, nibble and giggle, giggles, or even coffee and comedy. Um, naturally, you can have pun puzzles or tickling trivia. Men's groups could be humor groups. Uh, even your spiritual group, Holy Humor Sunday, I think is the first Sunday in April. And there are a lot of church blooper uh, chuckles that, that you can can gather. For example, for those who have children that don't know it, the nursery is upstairs. And don't forget your sensory and one-on-one. Assemble a humor cart uh, or a humor kit, humor on the go or smiles on wheels. Um, or it could be a cheerful cart or sunshine cart with sunflowers, yellow blooms, oranges, bananas, lemonades, and so forth. You can also incorporate something humorous into all of your one-on-one -on -one visits. For example, if you're having um, a plant visit, it could be humorous plant steaks or funny green thumb uh, jokes. Snack and hydration carts could be carry the crazy straws or some packaged uh, snacks that are decorated with smiley stickers. And for sensory kits, I put together items that are related to all the senses, ones that evoke pleasant memories adorable pictures of babies, family photos, stress balls, and so forth. And again, a reminder, humor is an umbrella term. It's anything that amuses, makes you smile or laugh, or elicits feelings of happiness, cheerfulness, playfulness, or joy. Excuse me. If you decide you wanna have a regular monthly humor program or weekly humor program, what are some of the things that you can do? Uh, funny sayings or quotes are always great. Riddles, knock-knock jokes. Comedian features are great. Joke finish lines are good, where you um, put um, uh, the joke on, on one um, card and put the punchline on another card and then try to match them up. Funny pictures of dogs and cats are always great. Funny definitions. I think there's a def actually a uh, definition day. Mad Libs are good. 
You can also do humor around your theme of the month. For example, if you're celebrating egg month, you could have joke day. Or if you're celebrating owl month, you can have owling with laughter. Amazingly, there are a lot of jokes about owls. And um, candid caption, candid ca uh, caption this is always great. You can take cartoons and cut off the captions, <clears throat> or you can take uh, a picture and then you try to write your own captions. Uh, you can find a lot of seasonal smiles related to the seasons of the month or, or weather. Smile, a smile show and tell <clears throat> where you ask everybody to bring something that puts a smile on their, on their face. Uh, tongue twisters, not, not a favorite, but they can work. Um, out of the mouth of babes, remember uh, kids say the darndest thing, that show. You can make up a questionnaire and hand it out to anybody that has young kids and ask them to come back with the replies and then share it with everybody. And don't forget that um, having intergenerational visits with small children is always brings a smile to people's face. Funny business, uh, funny names of products and businesses. I love the, the, the salon down the street, it's called Curl Up and Die. And then pun, we're kind of crazy about puns, that activity connection. In fact, we know that a team member has completely immersed themselves into our culture when they start writing puns in their, in their emails. And actually recently, uh, the president of our company, he was, he was very ill. And uh, he just happened to recently purchase a truffle farm. And so we sent out this message to him, sorry for your truffles. You are such a fun guy. Hope you feel better soon from the Activity Connection team. Funny road signs, Burma shave signs. You're probably all too young to remember them, but it was a series of signs, signs along the side of the road and um, as you drove along, it, it told a story like uh, the wolf is shaved so neat and trim, Red Riding Hood is chasing him. Uh, you can actually, there's a book out there called Verse by the Side of the Road. It's a wonderful little book, has all of the Burma shame size signs in them. Some communities, they actually have made uh, signs for along the hallway to the dining room and then they change them up every once in a while. It's a great program. Uh, la laughable license plates and funny bumper stickers, uh, bloopers in print. Johnny Caution was really good at that. He would find these um, bloopers, uh, ads and headlines in the newspaper and share them. Uh, pictures of funny mugs, uh, funny laws on the books, fa fatherly or motherly wit. And it can be um, on, uh, somebody like Goldilocks's mother. She said, I got this bill here for a busted chair from the Bear family. Know anything about that, Goldie? Uh, punctuation and grammar funnies are really fun. Uh, for example, did you know that a comma can save lives? Um, by, for example, um, is it time to eat, Grandma? Comma, Grandma, or is it time to eat, Grandma? And then another favorite is, I before C, I, I, excuse me, I before E, except after C. Well, that's weird because weird is W-E-I-R-D. And then and there are some funny videos out there that you can show. Um, Hi, Nancy, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah? Yeah, sorry, Nancy. Sorry, just for the heads up, we have about a one or two minutes left for the presentation. Oh, okay. Yeah, no problem. Um, you can start humor clubs, um, which, and also I would recommend that you maybe start an advisory board for a club. Uh, so I'll scroll down through these pretty quickly. Um, community events are great and a funny fashion show is fun. Uh, and then there are smile holidays for just about every day of the week. There's also uh, monthly smile holidays and you can make up your own. Um, and then there's always some guidelines for using humor. Like for example, naturally you don't use any humor that's, that will hurt somebody's feelings. And you have to be careful of generational understanding of different words like gay or mouse and more guidelines. I guess, uh, would you just like me to go to the end? 
Yes, probably we'll send the slides to everyone. Oh, okay. Um, as a follow up. Okay, great. Um, um, we talk about um, humor in the workplace and how important it is. It's also important to creativity and also to problem solving. And the last thing we do is talk about, do you chuckle, crackle, giffle, guffaw, hee-haw, wheels or snort? And it tells something about your personality. But then we end up where we began, an activity director walks into a bar. And so, you know, I really wanna thank the Activity Connection team for helping me put this together. They always make me smile. Thank you so much, Nancy. And thank everyone for your patience that we're, as we're now over. Um, if you don't mind on sharing your screen, Nancy, I just have a couple of slides with announcements I'd love to share to everyone. <clears throat> so let me go through these. Um, so Nancy, I uh, obviously had reviewed your slides before, but I, uh, you delivering them here was just amazing. So I, I really want to thank every, thank you and the Activity Connection team um, for putting all this together. We only have uh, three very quick but extremely meaningful uh, announcements to make, which is that, and this is probably for me the biggest one, is that we're very pleased to announce the fact that Activity Connection has uh, joined the Activity Strong initiative at the same level as Link Senior, uh, NAP, and NCAP. So I want to take the time to thank Nancy and you, Matthew, who has helped us put that together, and Don, and everyone else on the uh, Activity Connection team. It's really meaningful for us after a year of developing this platform to see the, the oldest and probably one of the biggest leaders in resident engagement join the initiative. And as Matthew puts it, in the end, it's all about the elders that we serve and creating this, his expression, this Justice League. So we're very excited to uh, welcome Activity Connection and excited about what is to come in that partnership. Also, as some of you might be aware, we have a Link Senior has a very meaningful partnership also with Activity Connection called Better Together. And we're going to drop the uh, link here. It is about offering an exclusive um, product and packaged and pricing to Activity Connection subscribers. That is the second announcement here. And the third announcement is that we are continuing to develop the educational series, and we are almost uh, uh, finalizing our Activity Strong Summit on June 22nd, 2011. As you can see from this slide here, we have fantastic speakers coming up, and uh, we're very, very excited. So everyone, thank you for your time. Thank you for joining. Nancy, again, thank you for probably one of the most important things today and this week for me anyway, uh, a reminder of how important uh, it is to laugh. So with that, I'd like to wish everyone a good uh, a laugh today for the rest of the day and uh, hope to talk to everyone soon. Take care, everyone.